Her mom was told uh, nothing very hopeful to institutionalize her. Fortunately, her mother uh, decided to do something more intensive uh, and try out intensive therapy. Temple worked hard and went on, not only through all of that, but to earn a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate studying science and the master's and doctorate in animal science. Today, she's a professor at Colorado State University. You may know she's been the subject of many movies and documentaries. Uh, probably the best known is the 2005 biopic uh, starring Claire Danes that I understand went on to win seven Emmy Awards, and she tells great stories of being at the Emmys, uh, a Golden Globe and a Peabody Award. She's also the subject of the documentary, The Woman Who Thinks Like a Cow, <laughs> and also was featured in Errol Morris's series, First Person. She's been featured in lots of media, New York Times, Forbes, Discover Magazine, NPR, BBC, and was listed in Times 2010 100 most influential people under the category heroes. She's the author of numerous popular books. Uh, in my experience, her books on autism get read cover to cover. You can see all the dog ears you know, in our copies. And they've been officially impacted so many people's lives. Here at MIT, we not only look to her and her writings and insights to understand autism and how different minds work, uh, we also have learned from how wonderfully different minds work how to better understand social interaction and things that are hard to teach computers uh, and how to improve uh, lots of kinds of experiences with this information. We think, I think, uh, the autistic brain has many advantages over the neurotypical brain. So now, without further ado, I'd like to um, have you join me in welcoming Dr. Temple Brandon. Mic's on and working. Mm -hmm. Is it working? Mm -hmm. Is this one working? Yeah. All right, maybe I better use this one. I don't want to take it off the stand. I like to move around a little bit, so I'll just use this one. Okay, lots of things to talk about today. And I used to think that everybody thought the same way I did, thinking in pictures. I didn't know that my thinking was different. Kind of discovering that my thinking was different. That's been a real journey. You know, when does normal variation become an abnormality? You know, a little bit of autism gives you a lot of MIT students. <laughs> <laughs> when I was out in Silicon Valley, I talked to a human resources lady, and she says, oh, we know they're on the spectrum. We don't talk about it. <laughs> well, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be talking about that a bit more. You see, a little bit of the autism trait gives you a brilliant computer scientist. Too much of the trait? person remains nonverbal. And there's more siblings in creative careers and in, in, um, you know, when people are bipolar. You see little bits of these traits give them advantage. They're continuous traits. They're embedded in the genome. If you got rid of all of the autism genetics, there won't be any more MIT students. It's about that simple. What would happen to little Albert today? No speech until age three. Lots of temper tantrums. He'd definitely be labeled autistic today. Famous musicians like Mozart and all the famous people like that probably were on the spectrum. Uh, little Stevie, a weird loner, he brought snakes to school, turned loose just to liven up the classroom. And what saved him when he was uh, being bullied and teased in high school was the hands-on things that he did with a neighborhood computer club. You know, genetics and personality, it's like a music mixing board. You're going to find all this genetic stuff. It's really, really complicated. Little tiny snips, lots and lots of them. And a lot of these traits, anxiety, can, you can dial it up or dial it down. Visual thinking, more visual thinking, more mathematical thinking. Things are continuous traits. Now, being a total, complete visual thinker, that's been an asset for equipment design because I can test run my cattle facilities in my head. And I used to think that everybody could test run things in their head. I didn't know that other people couldn't think the way I do. 
you know, sort of learning that thinking is different has been really, really uh, beneficial to me. Okay, let's see what kind of visual thinkers we've got. Think about a church steeple. How does it come into your mind? I just see specific ones. See, my concept of what a steeple is is made out of specific examples. But then I had speech ther therapist say, we've got a pointy thing. Mm -hmm. I don't see any pointy thing. We go, oh, wow. All the, all the thinking really is different. There's one of my drawings. Now, the thing is, when you're a really weird geek, the way you sell yourself is by showing off your skills. The way I sold design jobs was to show people my drawings. And they go, oh, you did that? <laughs> now, the thing is, a lot of kids that back in the 50s used to just be called geeks and nerds are now getting labeled mild autism today. And I'm getting worried they're getting the handicap mentality. I'm seeing uh, not enough teaching of basic skills, shaking hands, how do you order food at McDonald's, how do you just go in and talk to store staff, you know, just real basic kinds of things. You gotta stretch these kids. You gotta kind of pull them just outside their comfort zone to get them to succeed. <laughs> now, I used to joke around that maybe I had a huge visual thinking circuit going deep into my visual cortex. Yes, I do. It goes all the way from primary visual cortex up to the frontal cortex. So every thought I have is a picture. And then if I hold that picture, I can turn it into a video. Then I can start to get other sensations with it, like touch, smell. But the picture always comes first. That's just another slice. You can see that it goes all the way from the very back of the visual cortex up to the very front of the frontal cortex. That's probably in about the top 20%. Now, this is a normal fiber bundle for speak what you see. It goes from the visual cortex up to the language area. That's a normal one. That's mine. <laughs> and these fibers go all deep into the frontal cortex. So you give me a word, it's sort of like Google for images. <laughs> Words just bring up pictures. But I pay a price for that. You count the number of fibers I have for speak what you see, I got less bandwidth. There's less fibers. So I had delayed speech. And fortunately, mother took me to Boston Children's Hospital. And there's a neurologist that was back there, this would be like about 49, Bronson Crothers. And Bronson <coughs> Crothers tested me for epilepsy. I did not have that and referred me to a little speech therapy school that two teachers did in their basement. So by the time I was two and a half years old, I was getting really good early therapy. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of doing it. And I finally learned how to talk. Well, what's blue is full of water, and my left parietal area is pretty well trashed out, and I pretty well wrecked the algebra department. I do a lot of talks to um, you know, parents, groups, you know, areas where it's very low income, and. I let them know about all the great free stuff that's online. Because you've got to get kids showing them interesting stuff to get them interested. But I wanted to learn how to program this computer. That was just impossible. Still, um, Bill Gates had access to this exact same computer, and he learned it. OK, this is one of my most important slides. This is the different kinds of minds. I'm a photorealistic visual banker. Algebra is like hopeless. Why is algebra the prerequisite for geometry? Because I'm finding when I talk about this, a lot of people can do geometry. And they pounded away on algebra, I never got to take geometry. So how did I manage to get into college? Well, fortunately, I was allowed in on probation at Franklin Pierce College in Ringe, New Hampshire, when it was only two years old. And the math requirement back then was finite math, probability, matrices, and statistics. And with lots of tutoring from Mr. Dion, the wonderful young math teacher, and I went to his office and he tutored me during office hours, I was able to get decent grades in this class. Thank you, finite math. And one of the big problems that we got in education is fads. Education is hard. Too much top-down thinking and fads. Now, the kind of minds you have here is the pattern thinker, the mathematician, the engineer. You think in patterns. See, in your brain, you got circuits for what is something. That's my kind of mind. The other kind of circuit you got in the brain is where is something? Where are you located in space? That's the mathematician mind. These kids often have trouble with reading. You know, and if you got some little third grader that's super good at math, don't bore them doing baby math. Let them do the more advanced stuff. Then you got the verbal facts guy, and uh, knows all the favorite, all the baseball scores and certain things that he's really interested in. <coughs> Probably not going to be here. Uh, you're going to be mostly pattern things. 
and then you got the auditory neurons. Now there's evidence that two kinds of visualizers actually do exist. Marie Kosnikov, been at Harvard, done uh, some work on this. When I found these papers, I was so happy because I kind of discovered that, that the pattern thinker was different than me just on my own interviewing people. Now I've got science to show that it's real. <laughs> and my book, The Autistic Brain, has all the references. Because today we got to have evidence based for everything. And, oh, I hope I'm not knocking the, the presentation out of the computer here. That would be bad. You know, another big problem we got in education is we get hung up on just single ways of teaching math or single ways of teaching reading. You can teach it more verbal or more visual spatial. I learned reading with phonics. Dick and Jane books were totally useless. See, Dick, work, work, work. How totally, absolutely boring. <laughs> and then there's other kids that learn the whole world. Well, what we want to do is you want to get them to, um, to read. We're getting too hung up on, you know, whatever the latest fad is. Now I want to give you a glimpse into the world of the pattern thinker. That praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. This is the mathematical model. It's kind of behind us here. And that background is the folding pattern. That's definitely not my kind of mind. In fact, with certain kinds of things, rotating objects in space, I do badly at. I have no working memory. Okay, so how did I memorize how a whole big meat packing plant works? I videotaped it into my head. That's how I did it. It took six months of Tuesday afternoons to videotape the whole entire plant into my head where I could just walk through it in my mind. You know, then I don't have to worry about working them. It's back there in the video files. There are some great little origami stars that some kids made at a meeting. <laughs> Always like to show drawings off. We've got a good projector here. And here's a gorgeous piece of artwork that a boy with autism made. He's now doing professional art shows and selling $6,000 commissions. What we've got to work on is what the kid can do. Kids with labels. And the thing is, today's educational system if you want to get any kind of special ed service, you have to have a label. ADHD, dyslexic, autism, learning problems, whatever. Otherwise, you don't get any services. And kids that used to just be called geeks and nerds now are labeled autism. And I get worried that a lot of future good MIT students are ending up playing video games and social security because nobody worked with them to develop their strength. Also, teaching them job skills. That's another big problem. We need to get back to a lot more 50s things, like paper routes for 12-year-olds. And when I'm down south, getting some of the low-income areas, you know, lots, uh, lots of good church jobs. Ushers, setting up chairs. These are things that need to start at age 12, because they've got to learn <coughs> discipline and responsibility of having a job. When I was 13, my mother arranged a little sewing job with a freelance seamstress. And after I got kicked out of ninth grade, one of the schools right around here for fighting when a girl teased me. I went to Hampshire Country School up in Ringe, New Hampshire, and I did no studying, and I cleaned a lot of horse stalls. <laughs> My parents spent a lot of money for the privilege of having me clean horse stalls. But the thing is, I was learning work skills. You know, there's a responsibility. Every day you clean the stalls, you put the horses in and out, you feed them, you do everything in a really responsible way. Now I'm going to show you why you guys need people like me, who are absolutely awful at math. You need me to prevent accidents like the Fukushima nuclear power plant mess. It's still leaking radioactivity. And they tried to freeze the ground to stop it. Oh, come on now. <laughs> how could you have let these melt down? But first of all, how did it happen? And when I found out why it happened, they made a visual thinking mistake. And what I've learned is the mathematician doesn't see it. The visual thinker sees it. I can't design a nuclear reactor. But the one thing that I would never do, if I had been drawing the concrete for it, and I would have been drawing all the side views of the concrete, and I go, wait a minute. You just put your emergency cooling pump and your emergency generators in a non-waterproof basement. That's not really good when you buy the sea. <laughs> and electrical things don't run underwater. That's all I need to know. If they bought waterproof doors, it would not have happened. It's that simple. How did you let this happen? And when I was young, I used to say it was because they were stupid. Now I've learned it's because they don't 
see it. The mathematician doesn't see it. I just talked to the girlfriend of a mathematician. She says, I don't know which one my boyfriend. He came in and he put the roll of toilet paper on the stove right over the pilot light. <laughs> well, that's another thing I wouldn't do. This would burn the house down. <laughs> you see, this is where different kinds of minds need to work together. You need people like me, the safety systems. Okay, there's concerns about hacking of the power grid. I can tell you how I protect that. I want to get some old 50s electromechanical controls because I've got to protect the big equipment from getting damaged. If it gets too hot, spins too fast, or gets too much pressure, I've got to shut it down. It's hacker proof. I don't, you know, okay, they mess up the controller, yes, it cause a power failure, but it won't wreck expensive infrastructure. You've got to protect that. Now, the world needs both kinds of minds. One of the big problems we have now in biomedical research is replicating study results. And I think part of the problem is people don't write down the methods of the experiment. I review journal articles and I might not put down the breed of cattle they used. That's going to affect the results. Also, in science, you start off with observation. Some people say, well, if you don't have a controlled experiment, it's not science. And then I go, what's astronomy? What is the control for the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, I think originally it was a spy satellite, so maybe that was its control. <laughs> I had a wonderful talk with Karen Watson just this summer. I got an honorary doctorate from Texas A&M University. She's the provost, a wonderful lady my age with a big gray braid hanging down the back of her neck. And we talked about the whole problems of being a girl, getting into engineering. She's my age. And then we talked about problems where the kids, you know, you take them just on math scores, they can't estimate things. I'm going to talk about that more later. Now, in my work with animals, they see visual detail. A coat on a fence, a hose, a uh, person walking by, a reflection, some little thing that we tend to not notice, they see. You know, no one thought to look at the things that the cattle were seeing. I see little things that they don't see that are obvious to me. And these things make the animals balk and not want to go through the chutes. All right, let's see how good your observation is. How many people saw that that animal was looking at the sun? Good. We're doing much better than most people. Maybe we got more visual thinking in than what I thought. Look at how the horse and the zebra have an ear on each other. And in the slaughter plant, I'm always getting asked, do they know they're going to get slaughtered? I found that they behave the same way in both places. And if you want to see how a slaughter plant works, you can go to Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Brandon or Pork Plant Video Tour. And this is one part of the industry where there's been a lot of improvements. When you have a big customer like McDonald's or Wendy's insisting on things being improved, things get improved. I have a saying, heat softens steel. And I, dev I devised a very simple way of scoring plants. You know, now you can do data analytics and score so many things. Well, I score five things in the plane. The really important things, like how many cattle did you shoot the stunner and make them dead on the first shot? That's really important. How many were moving and fell around their heads on? How many fell down during handling? Easy things to score that are outcomes of problems. And I was amazed at some of the shabby old plants we made work with a lot of just repairs, non flooring, and then lighting. Add a light because they don't like to go into the dark. Move a light to get rid of a reflection. Now we're going to do the Texas A&M engineering ethics test. I'm very proud I got this right. A heavy tool is dropped on the wing of an airplane at the Boeing airplane factory. You are the manager of this operation. It stresses the metal close to the critical limits. What do you do? All right, maybe we need to look at the factory. What is the right answer? What do you do after the metal is stressed close to the critical limits? Oh, want to tell me? Don't overthink this. <laughs> Don't overthink it. What? <coughs> well, there's something else you might want to do. <laughs> you throw it away! <laughs> A part that's broken, you throw it out. Well, Ten years ago, 90% of the students got it right. And today, 60% get it right. You're trying to calculate it too much. You throw away all the stressed parts. Now I'm visualizing, because I immediately said to you, don't use it. That's what I said. Whatever well, parts that are stressed. Now I'm visualizing myself supervising the destruction of these parts. 
because I want to make sure they don't get put in another airplane when I'm not there. If it's a small part, I'm going to personally bash it with a hammer. If it's something big, I'm going to stand there while a hydraulic press crushes it. Because I've got to make sure it's never used. It's going to be smashed to the point where it cannot be used. I'm very proud that I've got that one. Okay, Steve Jobs was fascinated with calligraphy. He was an artist. Every time you look at your smartphone, it was made by an artist. Art rules Apple. The engineers have to figure out how to make the inside of the phone works. It's an artist. Kind of a, and they like calligraphy. You know, I think this is something we got to think about. Some people kind of question the humanities. I gave a talk about a year and a half ago in a state I will not say the name of. But the governor of that state said, well, at the state universities, we need to charge more for students along the humanities majors because those are useless. <laughs> and uh, David Beresh from the Chronicle of Higher Education says, well, the connection between Steve Jobs and so-called useless humanities programs, such as calligraphy, should not be ignored. And here's some interesting things. We're reading the real good classic literature helped on social skills. That was published in science. Yes, there are some good things you can learn from the humanities. Now, there's evidence that language covers up things like visual thinking and mathematical thinking. Because there's a type of Alzheimer's, and as the language parts of the brain get eaten out, the art ability will come out in some of these people. And when Van Gogh was painting Starry Night, the statisticians figured out it had mathematical patterns in it. I go, oh, wow, that is really, really, really trippy. Oh, man, cool. <laughs> now, as a visual thinker, I'm a bottom-up thinker. There's two ways you can approach problem solving. Top down, and what's happening now is people are getting too top down. Education theory is a good example of that, some other BS thing that they're doing, and they go completely overboard on it. I'm bottom up. I take all the bits and pieces, and then I take specific examples and I put them together into categories. Okay, if I was working on what would work in healthcare, well, what happens to Susie that's walking, working at Walmart? What happens to Tom who works at the bank? What happens to the college professor? You know, go through a bunch of different demographics. You know, they get a broken leg, what would happen? They got diabetes, how would that be treated? You take specific examples, start sorting them out. And you take, you, concepts are made out of specific <coughs> examples put into categories. One of my big concerns today in government is we're getting people get, oh, they get a degree in political science or law. They've never done anything practical, and then they get a job inside the beltway with a congressman or with a lobbying group, and it's all an abstraction. I think that's one of the reasons why we get so much problems today. All right, here's just an example of teaching a concept like up. You've got to have many different specific examples. My thinking is also associative. It's not linear. It's associative. Okay, so I'm at the United Concourse. I was just there yesterday. Oh, I think about that. Do I think about airports? Do I think about glass structures? Airports. Now I'm going through the food places. Concourse B is really dangerous. You've got Eli's Cheesecake Factory. You've got to get past that. <laughs> You've got the Tuscany Cafe, and they serve an entire loaf of bread that you can drizzle in olive oil and Parmesan cheese. <laughs> Last time I went there, I ate the whole thing. This time I didn't. I ate on the C concourse. <laughs> and you see how I'm getting into going to all the food places. There's no generalized pictures. And I had to walk by the Tuscany Cafe to get to my plane, but I'd already eaten it. Okay, glass structures. The biosphere, the Crystal Palace, our greenhouse at CSU. Now I'm seeing all our prized parking spaces they've, they've taken away while they're working on the greenhouse. It's not something I'm very happy about. How about the airport category? Denver, Atlanta, <coughs> Minneapolis. Um, how about good old the garbage? <laughs> it lived up to its name last week with that plane running off the runway. Oh, man. <laughs> now, when I asked an astrophysics professor about a church staple, he got motion and patterns of people praying. Oh, wow, trippy. This guy worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. That's not my mind. Now let's look at how specific visual thinking can be, because animals have visual thinking. It's really important to train your cat that a man on a horse is good and a man on the ground is good. Because if they see their first man on the ground when they leave the ranch, they'll panic. Think about it. 
man on the horse, man on the ground. It's two totally different pictures. Visual thinking is very, very specific. Now I find that when people try to solve problems, they tend to grossly overgeneralize. I don't care if it's a problem in a factory, whether it's a problem with an autistic kid, a problem with dog behavior. I can't believe the overgeneralization. They'll say things like, what do I do about autistic behavior problems in the classroom? Well, I do not know. I've got to find how old. Does he talk? What exactly is he doing? Or someone will go to me and go, my dog's crazy. What do I do about it? I don't know. <laughs> so I'm starting to visualize. Is he jumping on somebody happy? Is he biting? I have to find out what he's doing. You see, this is gross overgeneralization. When you get too top down, you tend to overgeneralize. OK, we're going to put iPads in all the schools. It's going to make them wonderful. Well, it didn't. <laughs> no. One of the things, it doesn't replace good teaching. Well, and there are the uh, people who uh, put the uh, Mars rover on Mars. How do people get into careers? The guy with the gray hair was a theater major. I'm getting really concerned. Too many schools are taken out. Cooking, sewing, woodworking, theater, arts. You know, kids are not getting exposed to enough things to find out what exciting careers they can be. They're getting really unrealistic views of things like marine biology. Okay, you watch Dolphin Tale? You're going to do marine biology on a clipper ship? I don't think so. <laughs> it's going to be some grubby old work boat. It's not going to be a clipper ship. <laughs> now, what you got to do to help the kids that are different? Okay, we're getting a lot of kids that ought to be coming here, get labeled autism, and they're playing video games on Social Security. And you got to stretch these kids just outside the comfort zone. <coughs> Another really important thing is mentors. Okay, I got a great science teacher from um, Hampshire Country School, and he got me motivated to study. And I go down to the low income areas, I said, why don't we get um, a retired car mechanic to teach small engine repair? What's the price of old lawnmowers? They're free. And I was up in the media lab, and they're doing just wonderful things here, but we've got to do things for our low income folks. Free videos, free programs. And how about figuring out cool things you can make out of broken computers? You know, take the intel inside out and make something cool out of it. You know, out of things you just throw away. You know, I think Lego Mindstorms are wonderful, and I promote them, but they're too expensive for a lot of kids, unfortunately. And learning work school skills. One of the things, I was not allowed to become a recluse in my room. I had to get out, and I had to do things. Kids need to be doing free play. Let me tell you an interesting story. I uh, was uh, talking to a lady that runs a summer camp for normal 8-year-olds to 11-year-olds on her farm. And they have a period in the afternoon where they do free play. She says these boys mope around for two days because they don't have their screens. They go through a drug withdrawal for video games and phones. Then a switch flips and they discover free play. We need to be doing more of that. OK, we already talked about taking out hands-on classes being so bad. You see, I've worked a lot of years in construction trades. Right now, we have a huge shortage of diesel mechanics and people to fix things. I keep the lights on in this building. These are the things that were my salvation when I was in high school getting teased. Also, electronics lab. Let me tell you, a really cool 60s electronics project. You take a rubber membrane, you stretch it over a speaker and glue little mirrors on it, and, it, and then you put a light on it, and it makes a light show on the ceiling. It's very cool. <laughs> And I wasn't studying, but I was sure making our ski tow house look really nice. More <laughs> work skills. We got to limit the time on the screen. So they gotta be doing some other things. Let's work on connecting the virtual world back to the real world. And that's something they're doing in the media lab. One mom did a real clever thing with Minecraft. She had a whole bunch of boards cut up, and then she had kids sand them and paint them and have Minecraft blocks. So I go online and I look at cool things you can do with Minecraft. And there was one thing I thought was really <coughs> was, okay, you want to make Minecraft Halloween costumes? By printing out the patterns, wasting like two printer cartridges full of color toner, <laughs> that's really dumb. No. How about poster paints? Let's just do it with poster paints. Really cheap and really fun. They're going to paint them, not waste printer cartridges. Animal projects, another great thing for some of these kids. My ability in art was always encouraged. I mean, art was my favorite class in high school. Kids get fixated on stuff. 
build on expanding that fixation. If he likes trains, let's do uh, read about the history of the railroad. Do math with trains. They kind of an associate of link back to that thing they like. There's great online resources. I've got to add Scratch to this, and uh, you know some of the great things that you're doing here to my list of free things. You know, a lot of parents today, grown up today, and they haven't done hands-on things. I see a real lack of resourcefulness. They don't even think to go to Google to look things up. I find it really unbelievable. Well, I got fixated on optical illusion rooms because it was shown to me. You gotta show kids interesting stuff to get them interested in interesting stuff. There's one of my designs in SketchUp. Oh, it's really fun to print it out the 3D printer. The thing I like about that is, again, you're connecting the virtual world back to the real world. And here's a great little children's microscope you can get for about $150. And I thought it was just wonderful. I went over to the gifted conference, and here were 10-year-olds that put all the phones away, and they were looking at leaves and flowers and pond scum under the Brock Magiscope. Great. This is what I find when I go from silo to silo. I'll go to an autism meeting, I'll go to a gifted meeting, and then I go out to Silicon Valley, or I come here, and at the gifted meeting, they're going down a really good road, but I see the same little geeks and nerds Sometimes get the handicap men mentality if they get labeled autistic. See, the problem we've got with autism is it's such a broad spectrum. You're going from someone who can't dress themselves to the heads of Silicon Valley companies. It's such a broad spectrum, it's almost useless. You know, you want to do research on it, you need to break it down into the symptoms. Learning and reading. You know, there's some evidence that doing things with your hands helps activate the brain. This is a little study. Uh, the kids had better comprehension from the still from a book where they used a paper book. Because if they used a book with a lot of electronic gadgets on it, they'd see that link, and all they could think about is clicking on that link, and they wouldn't pay attention to the story. Now, they did not do just a plain <coughs> electronic book. That would probably be the same. OK, I went out to Pixar, Disney Imagineering. And they've learned you have to touch to perceive. Okay, I've been in the meat industry for a long time, so for the first 20 years, everything was done with hand drawings. So I watched the industry, the engineering departments of the industry, go from hand drawing to the computers. And I noticed weird things started happening with drawings. Strange mistakes, like the center of the circle's in the wrong place. Um, if I wanted to change a stair step from a six inch rise to a three and a half inch rise, they didn't, they forgot to add more steps, so they ended up getting, so they ended up getting they weren't seeing these drawings. And in every case where I got these weird drawings, and I got them from every single major meat company, there was some 22-year-old kid had taken the CAD class, but he'd never built anything, and he'd never drawn by hand. He had not used his hands. Then I go to Pixar and Disney Imagineering, and they're printing characters out on 3D printers. Guess where they put the figurines? Around the computer mouse. So you can touch. You can touch your things. You've got to touch. They still do hand drawing in Pixar. <coughs> Had a great science teacher. You know, we need to be getting a lot of retired folks to get in and be, um, you know, mentor some of these kids. You know, when you think about big sums of money, we need to be, I like to visualize real things. The Denver airport's worth $5 billion. Back in 2008, when you had the, uh, you know, the big mess, that was equal to an airport for every state. All right, that's $5 billion. It buys the land, all the utilities, everything. Everything's included except airplanes and vehicles. Everything else included all the buildings, all the car rental parking lots. Well, $5 billion is going to be about the same price as Apple's new headquarters, the mothership. You know what? They ought to be ashamed of themselves that they are spending an airport's worth of money for the mothership. Let's do what... Uh, Bill Gates has done. You know, he's taking some of that money and doing things that's going to help society to be a better place. Apple needs to be doing some of that too. And when I found out how much the mothership was worth, I about threw up. And of course, I was on an airplane when I, uh, when I was reading that. That's where I read most of this stuff because I read tons of business stuff. Every business magazine there is just about it. I read it. Okay, what do employers want? They want people to know how to work. That's one of the things that they want. So let's say you're kind of weird. How do you sell yourself? I did it by showing off my work. You know, and there's companies now that are recognizing the value that, you know, people on the autism spectrum have. But they need to have much more specific instruction. 
You can't be vague and say, you're too aggressive or you're not a team player. They're not going to know what that means. You have to be very specific. It's like training a person on how to behave in a foreign country. That's how you train them. All the social skills have to be taught, like coaching an actor in a play. Let's say you got a kid going to have me a museum tour guide. You demonstrate the correct distance. You demonstrate breathing. It's like coaching somebody in a play. Another thing you can have, and the reason why I'm making you stand back, is because your motion drives me absolutely crazy. You see, this is where there are some sensory problems, not autism, so a lot of reasonable accommodations. You just have to stand back a little further. I'm not saying you can't be that. I just have got to get you out of my, my peripheral vision because I have a problem with attention shifting slowness. Okay, I was on the phone in the kitchen, and um, Rods came in, and uh, I couldn't answer a question while I was trying to write down a phone number. I do not multitask well. Uh, and you can get these sensory problems along with lots of different labels, autism, dyslexia, learning, ADHD, and a lot of other different labels. And it can, these, these problems can make it very difficult to hear in a noisy uh, place, or maybe bright lights really bother you. When I was a young kid, I couldn't stand loud noises. I can't hear when there's background noise, and, and I still do not hear hard consonant sounds well. My speech teacher had to slow down, enunciate the hard consonant sounds. So I'm in the noisy meat packing plant, and the plant manager's talking to me. I just go, uh -huh, uh -huh. I said, all right, let's go outside. <laughs> because I'm basically functionally deaf if there's too much background noise. Tension shifting slowness. OK, I see her move, and that's why I turn a little bit so I can't see her. I, I can't screen that out. And then that attracts my attention, and then I forgot what I'm talking about. One of the little tips in working with some of these little kids is you've got to give them time to respond. This is where 50s, old-fashioned parenting, really helped a lot of these kids. Because instead of screaming no, they give the instruction. Like if I want to put my finger in the mashed potatoes, my mother would say, use the fork. And when I was in elementary school at Dedham Country Day School, and I lapped the ice cream like a dog, they just picked it up and went, you're not a dog. No, I never did that again. <laughs> Some kids that have dyslexia, you can see the print jiggle on the page. I want to make it very clear, this is not all dyslexias. But there's a subgroup, and there's a simple treatment for this. Print the book on colored paper. Maybe tan, gray, light blue, light green, lavender, all your pale colors. It doesn't help everybody. But you see, I came out of construction trades, and I work with a lot of the low-income folks, and i got to have things that they can afford to do. And sometimes something this simple will work. Get rid of the old tubular fluorescent lights. Thank goodness those are going away. A lot of people see them flicker. Some kids need breaks where they can calm down. Also, somebody on the spectrum would panic. So say they come in and construction workers are just torn up the office with no warning. You know, just have some warning. And I still can't stand scratchy clothes. Can't stand it. Well, there's two of my projects, just starting out. And I have learned that being in the construction industry has really affected how I approach problem solving. You see, when you build something, you've got to finish it and make it work. It's all about outcomes. You've got to get things that actually work. It's all about outcomes. And I want to see kids that are different get good outcomes, like come to MIT, get a great job. Maybe they can go play around in the mothership. That'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> but maybe our best and our brightest someone need to go into teaching. I've read a lot of things about education. Finland has good schools. Because if you want to go to MIT or Harvard, one of the majors is teaching. They're putting that right up there in importance, along with tech. I think education needs to take a more outcome-based approach. I'm getting very concerned that a lot of um, a lot of um, really bright kids are getting screened out. We got to get back to doing real things. You know, we got some of our best and our brightest that want to like use computers to game the commodities market. You want to be ashamed of yourself. The <laughs> corn market's gone absolutely crazy from eight dollar corn down to three fifty corn. A cattle pastures got plowed off the plant corn, which should have never happen. And then the people went broke after they bought that land. It really messes things up out in the Dakotas. Been there, I've seen it. It's not something you should be doing. All right, what did my generation do? We built the interstate highway system. Well, I can remember when they built 128 right near my house. 
We went to the moon. Why is going to the moon important? It inspires kids. It inspires kids. That alone made going to the moon worthwhile. Well, what does the mothership do in Cupertino? Well, maybe some people want to be kings. I think some people in the tech industry need to think long and hard about some of this stuff. And you know what I learned when I first started designing Krauss? I designed Krauss for some very rich people. They had two jets in their hangar and a couple of bearings, too. That's a real high, high top of the line propeller plane. I'll tell you right now, that did not buy happiness. It does not buy happiness. I learned that in my 20s. You know, what is the meaning of life? I think the meaning of life is if you do something, it makes the world a better place. We need to take all the brains in here and figure out how to make the world a better place. And I'm getting worried about that quirky kid getting shunted aside. You need the art, too, so you don't have mess-ups like Fukushima. Don't have it. Well, now, we've got some time for questions. <laughs> I'm going to pick something. <laughs> okay? Yeah, um, so you talk about a lot, of, a lot about individualized education, and I really like it, but I always I struggle with, like, where do we find the resources for this? Because I Resources? How do we find resources? Let's get resourceful. When I work in construction, there was no internet. You picked the horn up. You got to pick that horn up, and you got on it until you found the resources. I'll tell you another mistake the Japanese made, you know, social. They never picked the horn up and asked for help. How could you do that? How could you sit there and let them burn up? Okay, you need a helicopter, and you have some time. It doesn't burn up right away. There's a few days. They've got some time. They never picked that horn up and asked for help. They never called the manufacturer of the reactor. How could you do that? All right, let's think of resources. Let's tap into retirees small engine repair class. I, I want I, I, one thing I really recommended they do in the media lab is let's figure out fun things we can do with old broken stuff that they can get. But let's, let's, you know, when I, one thing, my parents spent a lot of money to send me to Hampshire Country School and live on a farm, clean horse stalls. My parents paid for me to clean horse stalls. Well, they also used to get all the little army surplus junk. If you could make it out of that, you could make it. That also taught resourcefulness. Well, we had big sheets of brass and it cost a fortune now. And then things like parachute cloth and canvas and all kinds of stuff, all kinds of weird things too. We make stuff out of it. Yeah, and we, uh, you know, we've thrown a lot of money at the schools and got to start figuring out how are we going to make things work? Okay, one big problem on early intervention with autistic kids a lot of school systems, I travel all over the country, they'll do two hours a week of speech or of, you know, intervention. That's not enough for the little kids. But it's enough for professional guidance. Okay, so in a big church down in Texas, and I'll say, why don't we get volunteers from the church and work with a kid, and they can watch that teacher, and then the teacher is telling them how to do it. So you get professional guidance. Two hours a week is plenty for professional guidance. And then start getting more resourceful on things like this. Okay? Hi. Great to see you again. What are the most important life skills to teach someone with autism? What age? Say in the medium. Age, spectrum, the age, be specific. Six. <laughs> six to twelve. Six to twelve. Manners, shopping, shaking hands, chores in the home. When I was that age, uh, mother uh, had us be party hostesses, and Roz was telling me that when she was young, she had to be party hostess, and she hated it, but it taught her social skills. These basics, shopping, basic things, cooking, just basic stuff. I'm seeing too many kids that aren't learning these basics. A 12-year-old, I want a paper route substitute. Let's get creative on that. You can be walking dogs for the neighbors. Got to learn work skills. Six-year-olds, it's going to be please and thank you, shaking hands, simple chores. Yeah, I'm on the little basics because that's where I see the, the lack. You know, we're getting so that maybe, they, maybe they'll be able to do read and do math, but they won't be able to do anything else. Like we're going so crazy with testing in Colorado. That's all insane. Okay, back there. Mm 
lot of little kids have feeding issues. See, one of the things that needs to be done um, that's a sensory problem is autism, you can't, if you want to do studies on how to work with some of these things, you're not going to do it by blobbing all the autistic kids all together. There are a certain kind of kid that's a picky eater. Well, you need to be just studying those. Why are they such a picky eater? Another kid's got sound sensitivity problems. Another kid has visual sensitivity problems. And there's evidence that the um, whole system is overactivated and activates the fear uh, system circuits. I wasn't one of the picky eaters. One thing we got to do is not let the habit get started. Because I would have been a grilled to cheese sandwich fanatic if that had been allowed. I was allowed to have them. The you know, weekend I could have a grilled cheese sandwich for like Saturday and Sunday, uh, you know, I could have it. But other times I had to eat what was served. And, and I think it's okay to have a few things you hate, but when it gets to be where the kid's eating uh, chicken McNuggets and French fries and that's all, that's just ridiculous. We've got to try to not let them get into that. Okay? Okay, let's talk about anxiety. Well, then I had Edna and Rosin telling me to say that for tomorrow. Let's talk about some of that stuff. Well, not, not to say about anxiety, but you present that situation, and then this talk is about how you want to nurture your existing mind as it is. Well, you see, I'm getting conflicting things on what I'm being told to do. Okay, well, all right, I'll, tell, I'll do talk about some of that other stuff right now. Um, when I got into puberty, I started having nonstop panic attacks. My amygdala is uh, three times larger than normal. And as I went through my 20s, it got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then in my early 30s, I went on antidepressant medication, a low dose that saved me. There's a place for, the, for a little bit of the right kind of medication. The mistake that gets made with antidepressants is giving too high a dose. Now, I found that us visual thinkers, we're the panic monsters. The mathematicians are kind of in between. Because I've worked with other designers in the meat industry on that were not autistic, but they were all on Prozac or it was going to be drugs and alcohol. The, um, I, you know, there's a place for medication. Also, exercise, and I do 100 sit-ups every night. And I have to do them, otherwise I can't sleep. I, but there's, unfortunately, they do too many of the wrong kind of drugs. They give out the benzodiap, you know, the Valium-type drugs, and they get addicted to that. I just read a horrible article in the, in the Wall Street Journal this morning about baby boomers, boomers getting addicted to Oxycontin and Vicodin and all that stuff. That's a real mess. I know the best things to use for anxiety is antidepressants in low doses. Prozac's a really good drug. It works really well. The mistake that gets made is giving too high a dose. That, that's a really big mistake. Another problem you can get into is some people with autism have a real perfectionist thing. And this has gotten worse destroying really good work because they didn't think it was perfect. I think some of this gets back to no hands-on, they are doing hands-on things. Okay, you do hands-on things, sometimes it doesn't work. And then you have to figure out how to make it work. I found putting a sail on my red, red wagon just did not work very well. You no, know, but I learned that by trying it. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Right there. Um, children. I know that my interactions with children are, are just wonderful. My interactions with adults are more, much more challenging. And I've seen this in several of my other friends well, who are yeah, somewhere on this. You know, you're mentioning here that you interact with kids really well, but not with adults. <coughs> and then there's some autistic kids that don't get along with peers their own age, but they're getting along just great with adults. Um, see, some of the social circuits in the brain are not hooked up. That all has to be taught, like teaching somebody in a foreign country. It's not, uh, the circuits aren't there. <clears throat> you know, I didn't even know that people had all the secret little eye signals until I, learned, I read about it in a, in a book when I was 50. I was 50. <laughs> I didn't know about some of the subtle signals. You got to <clears throat> taught it. And it can be taught. <clears throat> you got to learn how to act in the play. And, and where I have the best social interactions is where we talk about shared interests, how to build things, you know, showing horses. This is why I'm such a big proponent getting some of these uh, kids involved in things where there's a shared interest. It could be Boy Scouts, it could be Lego Mindstorms, it could be, uh, you know, showing pigs at the county fair, uh, working in the, doing something with the farmer's market or a farm. 
you know, where there's shared interest sorts of things. Okay, right here. One of the topics that you stress are how the autistic brain is innately different and that you sort of cope with that by teaching these specific skills. But yeah. another one that you stress is the importance of social integration and being a member of society. You do have to be a member of society. So do you feel that those addressing those differences in children can make them feel different and give them difficulty to integrate into a society? You're talking too vague for me. You know, do you I, think that uh, making autistic children feel different can interfere with making them succeed in society that's not suited to Well, it's like I don't fit in with the bar scene crowd, and I don't do that. But I fit in really well with the guys when we're talking about how to build stuff. You know, that's where there's a lot of kind of creative people there. And some of the funniest stuff I ever did in my whole life is on the construction site. Sit around in the job trailer and we're talking about how to build things and about stupid suits. Those are, um, those are really good construction trailer talk. Um, and some of that was the most fun stuff. And the other thing is there's a scene in the movie where they slam down the deodorant and say, you stink, use it. You can't be a total rude, filthy, dirty slob. You just can't be. Yep, I'm eccentric. It's okay to be eccentric, but you can't be totally rude and, and, and nasty. And and where I where I have fun is with the shared interest things. That's why I stress it so much. You know, sitting down with my student and helping them figure out their thesis project, and then the project worked, or I designed something, we build it, and then it worked. That makes me really happy. Now are you a student here? Or? What do you do? I study psychology. You study psychology? Have you, another thing I'm going to say to every student, intern in career relevant internships. So you're trying on careers. Make sure that the career you're going to go into is going to be something that you're going to like. I'll give you an example of where people are not liking stuff. I was reading an article about marine biology and kids are going into that with very unrealistic expectations and then they find out they don't like all the computer work involved with analyzing data which is a really big part of it. Not just petting um, So what do you picture yourself doing when you graduate? I thought I was going to be an experimental psychologist. I didn't think I was going to be designing slaughterhouses. <laughs> no, sometimes you don't know where you're going. Well, Half, uh, half of all the cattle in this country are handled equipment I designed, so you buy some meat in the local store, went through all the big companies, they probably went through my equipment. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is your feeling on um, fixations and um, pervasive interests in autistic children? Channel them. Channel them. <laughs> okay, all right, let's just take an example. Okay, airplanes. There's a tendency to like stuff that moves. <clears throat> And airplanes and cars and things like that's a real and trains so are tend to be real common ones. Well, let's let's channel it so it's less fixing. Okay, let's read about the history of the railroad. Let's learn math with a train, physics with a train. So let's broaden it out. All right, he likes to draw Thomas the tank engine. All right, let's start drawing places where Thomas goes. Airplanes, cars, and trains, they go places. But you see, you're still getting an associate of link back to the favorite thing, which would be, would be uh, trains. You know, you, you tap into that, that motivation. When I was in third grade, all I wanted to do was draw horse heads all the time. And I was encouraged to draw other things, like a beach. And then my beach picture was so beautiful, the mother put it in a real frame of glass and hung it in her bedroom. That was professional brain art. <laughs> yes, and I, I recognize that. You, you encourage, you want to broaden it out. Instead of trying to stomp it out, broaden it out into other, more constructive things. Okay, the one that you're thinking of, just ask the question, what fixation was the kid you're working with have? Oh, um, cars. <laughs> okay, I've already answered this. <laughs> <laughs> it's already been answered, okay? <laughs> about um, I guess social relationships and friendships so sometimes I feel like you can learn you know how you're supposed to behave in a social environment but I feel like a lot of that is to like make close emotional bonds with people and I was wondering if you had some words or advice or thoughts on well I get, I get close friendships where we have shared interests 
like I really care about making my students be successful. The student goes out and lands a great job and does well in it. That makes me really happy. We got a student named Kurt. He's an assistant professor of animal science at the University of Wisconsin River Falls, doing great things. That makes him happy. That makes me happy. You know that it, it's uh, the shared interest thing is really important. Okay, right here. What do I think about medication? There's way too many meds given out to little kids. Yeah. Way too much. Mm -hmm. And powerful antipsychotics given out to little kids. It's all of it's just criminal. They're getting fat and getting diabetes. But on the other hand, careful, cautious, sensible use of meds. I've been on a med since my early 30s. An old-fashioned tricyclic um, called disipramine. Uh, they, the doctors today would probably rather give out Prozac or Soloft, and I'll tell you the reason why. If I take 100 disipramines, I die. If I take 100 Prozacs, I'll live for it. So they tend to prefer to use safer the drugs where, you know, if I want to, I'm not going to try to end my life with it. Um, but if I wasn't on that medication, I wouldn't be here today. Well, yeah. I specifically for ages, <coughs> I meant specifically medication for especially young boys and elementary. What kind of problem with young boys? Be specific. Don't well, overgeneralize. All right, how old a boy? Eight to ten. Okay, now the thing about the stimulants, like Ritalin, even though they're a pain in the butt because they're controlled substances, so <coughs> you have to do the prescription each month, they're actually some of the safest drugs. What I'm the most concerned about is things like the atypical antipsychotics, like they're giving Respiridol out as a sleep aid, and then the kid gets metabolic problems from it. That's horrible. Now the thing about Ritalin, two pills, you'll know, love it, hate it. The other thing that you can do with the stimulants that you can't do with other drugs is you can hop on and off them. You don't have to take them all the time. Where, they, where drugs like Prozac, something like that, you've got to, you've got to stay on it. You, um, you know, then you got mood stabilizers, things like Lamictal, which is an epilepsy drug. Um, if you find that works for you, you've got to stay on it. Um, well, what happened when he was took Ritalin? What did it do? I'm not thinking of a specific. I'm only thing. going to think specifics. So what I'm thinking of is the tendency to use medication. There's way too many what? meds given out like candy. Let, let's try some. All right, maybe before you do meds, Mother used to say in the 50s, lots and run the energy out of you. Get out there and run that energy out of you. The other thing is, if I just had pop tarts for breakfast by 10:30 in the morning, I'd be I all you know lightheaded. I think our metabolism needs to support the animal industry in a real heavy-duty way in the morning. And that, and that helps. There's no way I could be a vegan. There's no way my metabolism could tolerate that. And, you know, an egg in the morning, let's try an egg in the morning or sauce, biscuit, something like that in the morning. Exercise. Right, let's try that before you do medication. And then there's some kids where everyone works like magic. See, I think another basic principle if you try a med, try one med at a time to see what works, and it should have some wow. If it doesn't have some pop, then you don't take it. When I went on the antidepressants, I no longer had the feeling, okay, let me know what it was like for it to get antidepressants. Imagine if you had to work in this building, but they have put a hundred of the most deadly poisonous snakes in this building. And you never know where those snakes are going to be. You can't get rid of them, right? They just bring more. There's always a hundred <laughs> deadly poisonous snakes in this building. Now imagine how anxious you be all the time. You have to work in this building. You never know where these snakes are going to be. Well, that's the way my nervous system was before I took the antidepressants. And then I went on the antidepressants. This horrible fear went away. You see, the thing is on the meds, overall, is the younger the kid, the more conservative and careful you need to be. And you try one thing at a time. Okay, some kids react well with the diets. I read this interesting article about carnitine and depression. You know, that's meat stuff. And then you got... Um, Celebrex and depression, that's a uh, nice set arthritis medicine. There's getting to be research on inflammations involved in some of this stuff. Well, Celebrex is, you know, is, is it similar to aspirin, you know. And yeah, you do have to be careful about gastrointestinal irritation. You take some precautions like you don't take it and then lay down on the empty stomach. I go to gifted conventions, autism conventions, meetings like this, cattle conventions. I really like the mixture of going between the silos 
because I'm, I'm seeing the same kids going down different routes, and they're the same little geeks. Yeah, there's some, you see, the problem with autism is you've got somebody who's nonverbal and can't dress themselves, getting the same label now. I mean, the DSM-5 is a mess because now they've broadened it to where somebody who can't dress themselves is in the same diagnosis with somebody. You've you got lots of mildly autistic students here at MIT. I know you don't like to talk about it. That's what they say in Silicon Valley. HR says we don't like to talk about it, but you've got it. Well, there's a lot of the traits in the parents, but the problem I'm seeing is what with some, certain parents, when you get a kid labeled, they're not learning basic stuff. Okay, here comes a 10 year old that's fully verbal, doesn't know how to shake hands, doesn't know how to greet, doesn't know how to shop. I mean, I hate to harp on the basics. Okay, driving, that's going to take longer to learn. I learned on dirt roads, my aunt's ranch, three miles up the mailbox, three miles back, all summer, six days a week. Or you find a big empty parking lot and burn up a tank of gas to learn how to operate the car and then it's driver's it. Go someplace totally safe. It's going to take more practice. I was a year on easy roads before I did any freeways or traffic. We've got to work into it slowly. It's just going to take longer because of the mole, because I can't mole task. So I have to practice, practice, practice driving to where Braking, steering, and gas becomes goes vibrates back into the motor cortex. And then I can use the frontal cortex just for the traffic. I don't have to think about operating the car. And that's going to take a couple of tanks of gas burning up to get that in a completely safe place, like an open field or a vacant parking <coughs> or country dirt roads. What was it like to watch a movie of your life? What was it like to watch the movie? It was like going in a really weird. 60s time machine. <laughs> she became me. And I love the fact they put my drawings in the movie. All my projects were accurate. That I just loved. You know, because it really emphasized a lot of the kind of, you know, project sort of things I did. And I've had kids write to me that they saw the movie and it's motivating them to succeed. And then I think that makes my life worthwhile. Because a kid's not going to end up in the basement playing video games. There's too many going there. And they have kids that probably should come here. And they probably need a little medication. Because one of the reasons they're playing those video games so hard is because it calms them down. And these are the ones that need a little touch of Prozac. Maybe a little half a starter dose, just a starter dose. Because if you give them too much, you're going to get agitation and insomnia. And that's one of the big mistakes that gets made. And I talk about that in my book, Thinking in Pictures. There's a chapter called Believer in Biochemistry. And my Way I See It book. That's a more kind of a technical but easy to understand survey of medications. Okay? Hi. Um, you've described yourself as a very intense visual thinker, and I am also a very intense visual thinker. And do you usually think that this is associated with the autism spectrum? Oh, that, it, it, there's not, you see, the thing in autism, what tends to be the same is uneven skills. Good at one thing, terrible at something else. Now, everybody with autism is not a visual thinker. Some are word thinkers, and some are more mathematical thinkers. But the thing that tends to be the same is good at one thing, really bad at something else. Now, there are non-autistic, very vi heavy visual thinkers, too. You see, and then so-called normal people, they're, they're more of a mixture of the three. It, it's not as, it's as one-sided towards just one kind of thinking. And then I practiced my talk the first time for an old, an old engineer named Tom a guy my age. And Tom says, well, you can't just go in there and just say, this is horrible, that's horrible. You can't be so negative. You know, you've got to show something that's wrong, this is how you fix it. Be a little more positive about it. Well, I took old Tom's advice. Thank you, Tom. He was a work colleague. Isn't this terrible? I can't remember his last name. He had gray hair. I can see the office where he used to sit in relation to my office. And I'm thank you, Tom, for uh, giving me that advice. Because this is sometimes a problem just being way too negative. And I took a surprise and cleaned up my talk. 
and I gave my first cattle talk in 1974 at the American Society for Ag Engineers in Chicago. At the Hilton Hotel, I remember that. <laughs> How are we doing time-wise? Okay, right, okay, right off of here. Let's see, right here. Okay, the one of the questions that concern the handicap mentality. Well, what tends to happen sometimes is they go, oh, poor little um, Bill has got autism, so uh, uh, we'll buy his hamburger for him. I go, no, he has to march up to the counter and order it himself. So are you looking for more specific like diagnoses? I don't really care what the diagnosed. You know, don't get hung up on it. It's a behavioral profile. Okay, little Tommy is fully verbal. You're going to learn how to march up to the counter at McDonald's and order your own hamburger. And what you do is you don't take him in there during the lunch rush the first time. You take him in there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you sit at the table, and he's going to, okay, if, you know, maybe short on money, then you're going to go up there and just order a small drink. And you're going to have to do it yourself. I can remember when my mother made me go to the lumber yard myself to buy some lumber for a project. <coughs> she kind of really knew it when she had to push me. You know, you got a kid that's fully verbal, you got to learn how to shop. See, I mean, I'm seeing overprotection on just these little baby basics. You see, and what helped a lot of the geeks and the nerds in my generation is that old-fashioned teachable moments 50s upbringing. And if I went over to the Woods house, she corrected me. If I went to the Culver's, they corrected me. And if I went to Miss Edson's toy store, I messed around with her stuff. Well, let me tell you, old lady Edson, glasses with chains hanging out. Boy, she corrects you. <laughs> and the thing is, they didn't scream no. I remember at the Culver's house, I cut all my meat up first. And Mrs. Culver goes, and cut one piece off at a time, and then you eat it. They give the instruction. That's the old-fashioned, teachable moment. And we need to be doing a lot more of that. Because what I'm seeing, you know, working in skilled trades, I go on a big meat packing plant, one of the top 10 biggest plants in this country, and there's an old hippie in the maintenance shop, and I know he's on the spectrum, and he's my age. He runs a maintenance shop. I know another guy who has a huge metal fabrication company in the cattle industry. I'm not going to He's dyslexic, ADHD, bad speech impediment, probably autistic, and uh, flunked out of school, took welding, started building things and selling them. And he's got a great company. And then I'm seeing the junior version addicted to video games and going nowhere. And some people say, well, you're just an old fogey in your late 60s bashing video games. Well, if they were going into the video game industry, I wouldn't be bashing them. That's not what's happening. They're on a social security check playing video games. Now, where things are so much better now, I was the kind of kid that in the 50s, nonverbal, totally, you know, uh, screaming, constant tantrums, no speech at age three, they just threw us away in institutions. Thank you, Dr. Bronson Crothers at Boston Children's for preventing that from happening. And mother was really lucky that I went there. You know, so on the more severe end of the spectrum, we're getting better services. But I'm saying they, the geeks and the nerds, some of them are doing worse. Now, where a diagnosis is helpful is, I have another book called Different Not Less. It's 14 old, mildly autistic people that got diagnosed later in life because their relationships were a mess. And that's where a diagnosis gives insight. That's where it's helpful. <coughs> Giving insight in relationships. The book's called Different Not Less. Then I have another book called Unwritten Social Ro Rules that I co-authored with Sean Barron. And we kind of have different approaches to some of the, the social stuff. You know, I'll talk on a, sub on a certain subject and then, then uh, Sean will give his view. <coughs> what kinds of things do you do when you start to work with a new group of people so that they understand you well enough? When I work with a new group of people, all right, I work with what kind of group of people? Doing what? <laughs> You see, you see God, <coughs> age 12, and it's never too late to start, I want paper route substitutes. Dog walking for the neighbors, you've already done a lot of volunteer things. Uh, he really should have had a real job by now. Mm -hmm. um, what's he good at? Reading. <coughs> Reading, okay. Well, maybe he just has to get a job at a retail store or a shoe store or something. Mm -hmm. He's just got to learn how to do a job. 
Do you have any friends that own a store? No, but I was thinking Barnes and Noble or the. Library. All right, well then get them into Barnes and Noble then. Yeah. Go in there, grease the skids, just do it. And you gotta bypass all the stupid computer garbage that they, <coughs> they do. You just bypass that stuff. <laughs> you gotta talk a manager into like hiring. You know, and and uh, that might be a good job for him. And you may have to grease the skids, so because he, he's gonna be bad in the interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have any friends at Barnes and Noble store? <laughs> <laughs> what business are you in? Have any friends at Barnes and Noble? What business? You what? What business am I in? Yeah, I do sales, but what kind of sales? Um, laboratory sales for us. You know what? Some of these guys are really good at specialty retail. Really, really good. And they learn how to, you know, learn everything about all the products and can get really good at some. Maybe you're good at laboratory sales. And then you have to learn how to approach customers and not make it make customers mad by being mm -hmm. too pushy. Mm -hmm. So you sell them, you travel around to places and then sell stuff. Is that teaching me a trade? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a you know, guys that read are often, that are big readers, are often really good at specialized retail jobs. Now, have a good student in school? Mm -hmm. For the most part, it took, well, again, you know, um, the, the scattered skills, like you like to say, really good at reading and, and facts, but horrible at math. So three tries. Well, he doesn't need math to sell lab. Can he do, <laughs> can he do sixth grade, 50 style, old fashioned math? Mm -hmm. That's all you need for selling lab equipment. Maybe. Like find the can you find the volume of a cylinder? You might need that song. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just feel like the schools aren't doing a great job with the independent living skills. You know, no, they're not doing it. See, this is something where <laughs> did a better job. With them. Yeah. And and you've got these kids that don't know how to greet people. Okay, now this church in Texas, like a ten-year-old, he's gonna be church usher. Then what you need to do is you need to go through the congregation and get about 10 people to come up to the kid and, and you just, you know, want to talk to him, <coughs> you know, you just sort of grease those skids and do it because mm -hmm. they've got to learn that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you've got to learn uh, on sales, you know, when to back off and mm -hmm. I actually found I was good. Uh, when I was in my 20s, we had our Arizona Cattle Feeders annual magazine, and I learned how to talk like an ad salesman. So it's a beautiful color book, full bleed pages. <laughs> and, and I called up pharmaceutical companies that were supposed to be agency ads, and I sold some of them. I just asked for the marketing part. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. And I, 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 one time I did a book signing at Costco, and I thought I was a really good Costco sales associate. <laughs> I had never worked the retail floor before. And I went down to this Costco, and, and uh, uh, no one, they hadn't advertised the book signing. No one was gonna, knew I was going to be there. Well, they couldn't get to the meat counter without going by me. So I started just walking up to people, and I said, I'm a professor of animal science, uh, do, uh, I have a book about animal behavior, Do You Have Pets? Mm -hmm. And if I'd engage them, mm -hmm. I sold like 60 books. The entire book table only sold three. <laughs> <laughs> and then I backed right off if they didn't engage. Because mm -hmm. I didn't want to complain at the store manager. Yep. And I was keeping score on how many books I sold. No, oh, I'm a pretty good sales associate for Costco. <laughs> <laughs> I've never even done it before. Mm -hmm. But I kind of had a sense of when you just back off. Mm -hmm. And I, and I also found out that 20% of young families in Denver have no pet of any kind. Which I'm not a parakeet or anything, and I think that's real sad. <laughs> you know, was, this is going to be an entire day at Costco's and get very boring, so I just tried out, see how good I was at retail sales. I was pretty good. <laughs> you know, just get them into stuff like that. If it's not Barnes & Noble, it would be some other kind of store. Do you know anybody that owns a store? Or manages one. Uh, no, but I can certainly go talk. Well, you can go talk to them. That's right. You got to get the job done. Okay. That's what construction's all about. You pick, pick that horn. Now you get online and you go find the stuff. Mm -hmm. When I was doing it, it was the horn. One, one more question. Okay. Can you pass the mic that way? Did you play on any teams when you were growing up? Did. How did your teammates help you or hinder you? I actually, you know, when I was a real young kid, I was a rotten sport. This brings up another thing, teaching turn-taking. That was pounded <coughs> in with board games, starting at about age four. Part cheesy for it and Chinese checkers. Got to learn how to take turns. 
That's really important. And I was, you know, we had, we had soccer, you know, little soccer games. I was pretty good at that when I was in high school. The one thing I was good at was good volleyball. That was something I was good at, and I was recognized. I got a volleyball award right before I got kicked out of school for throwing a book at a girl who teased me. <laughs> and and I, yeah, for some kids, those are really good things. Well, I think we're going to end up, and we got to look at what they can do, not what they can't do. Thank you very much.